Quorum Radio, baby. Quorum Radio on now with Matt Bracken. As you'll recall, Matt Bracken is a former U.S. Navy SEAL. He went through Navy ROTC at the University of Virginia. He became, after his time serving the United States Navy uh, as a U.S. Navy SEAL, he did a number of things, but one of the biggest things he did was become a very successful fiction writer. His, his books, of course, Enemies, Foreign and Domestic, Domestic Enemies, Foreign Enemies and Traitors, Castigo K, which is the first of his Dan Kil- Kilmer novels, and Red Cliffs of Zerhoon. Red Cliffs of Zerhoon. By the way, in case you're wondering, how do you spell Zerhoon? It's Z-E-R-H-O-U-N, Z-E-R-H-O-U-N. Anyway, so Red Cliffs of, of Zerhoon, it's a great book, fascinating book, and Dan Kilmer is uh, the character that's living in a dystopian world uh, sometime in the future when things are just basically slowly but surely falling apart. And, um, and the, the, the thing that's fascinating, Matt, about that book, I hope you're doing well tonight. I, I understand you just had a vacation? Yeah, I, was, I live uh, in northeast Florida, but I was actually at the beach um, uh, near da- just below Daytona Beach at a you know, beach resort. And love, the- love to swim in the ocean. So, Matt, let me get into a little bit more about the this this incredible vessel called the Rebel Yell. Rebel Yell, why? Tell us about that name. Well, it has, it? It, it's a you know, multiple entendre name. It uh, refers to the Confederate battle cry, which is, I guess, a uh, little bit unpolitically correct. But um, I actually got the idea while I was watching a, a documentary about uh, – Billy Idol, where he was talking about his early career before he was well known. And he was at a party with um, Mick Jagger and Keith Richards. He was sort of like a backup band guy. Right. And he, he saw them drinking whiskey from a bottle and he, you know, had never seen it before. And he checked the bottle out and it was called Rebel Yell, which is a like a hundred proof bourbon whiskey and in the States. And, um, a little bit, a little bit lesser known brand, but um, that was the genesis of Billy Idol's song "Rebel Yell," which I really, I loved. And uh, when I lived on a different boat in South Florida a long time ago, one of the boats that was tied up at a marina next to me was also called "Rebel Yell," so it, it was always kind of in the back of my mind. And uh, that, that's. Uh, how I chose that name for the name of the boat in the Dan Kilmer novels. <clears throat> Which is kind of perfect in a way, because uh, one of the things about Dan Kilmer is that he's kind of a, a, a rebel against the established system that leaves him as basically an ex-Marine that's uh, either, either going to be homeless or a man without a country and a boat in the open ocean, right? Right, because it, in the, the setup for the first Dan Kilmer novel, he, he's in the Bahamas, which is close to Florida, but he can't sail back to Florida because uh, he'll, he'll lose his boat for back taxes. You know, it, it's, and this is a pretty real world problem. The, his only asset is the boat. And uh, yeah. in the novel, they've passed all kinds of laws that it doesn't matter if you're in the country or out of the country, you have to pay into the national health plan and other things and he hasn't yeah. done so if he returns as soon as they check his passport and his his irs file you know they'll say you're in arrears on your tax debt and if you can't pay we'll just take the boat so he's an american <clears throat> excuse me who can't return to america and he also can't you know work legitimately overseas because he's you know he's a you know a foreign national anywhere he goes you know, you're welcome. Right. In general, you're welcome if you arrive as a tourist with money, but not if you are, if you uh, come to work. So he has to. Oh, sure. And and the boat itself is going to take you know in today's money, more or less about ten thousand a year just to support the boat, just to keep the boat in paint and sails and diesel fuel. So he's got to come up with money, otherwise the boat will deteriorate, uh, and eventually you know be, be uh, worthless. So he's right. got to, so, he's got to earn money by his wits outside of the system, outside of America. Right. So, so and then, you know, what I find fascinating is that um, <clears throat> he sails up to, uh, I guess on a Tom Placid 
summer day when the when the uh, ocean, the Atlantic North North um, East Atlantic, is a little bit calmer. He goes. He runs up to uh, Greenland, where there's uh, what an abandoned NATO base. Right. What's that he, all about? That's that's the setup for the Red Cliffs of Zerhoon, which begins with the boat in Ireland, um, where he has sold half of the cargo. Uh, you know, which is uh, you know ninety some drums of fuel that can fit into the cargo hold uh, between the two masts on this trading schooner, uh, sixty foot. Uh, steel sailboat and it has enough room for you know 90 55 gallon drums of diesel which he wow. has he has liberated from an abandoned NATO base. I mean, this is, this <laughs> liberated, is at a point in the, well this is at a point in the future where the u.s military has it's sort of like that the period of the years after the fall of the soviet union yeah you know, where ships were just tied up and and abandoned so he, sure. he's and um have- he's got a tip yeah, he's got a tip that they've just, you know, abandoned a base and uh, the diesel drums are just sitting there. So they fill the boat up, they motor to Ireland, and then they're trying to sell the fuel, uh, which is how he winds up being in the place, at, you know, the right t- place in the right time to be, you know, strong-armed into going on this rescue mission in Morocco. And they know it has a great cargo holding capacity. Well, let me, let me ask a question. The Rebel Yell in, in the book... Um, Red Cliffs of Zerhoon is like, what, a 60-foot steel schooner? Right. Okay. So how much, literally, how much could it hold in terms of tons, tonnage? Um, the, the boat itself, if it was um, empty, would, would weigh somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 70 or 80,000 pounds empty. But, yeah. um, you know, depending on its construction – but you could load another easily load another thirty thousand in it, and be low on your water line, uh, especially if you were carrying something like diesel, because you would just run the engine nonstop. You know, you would just run it like you were a you know, an Alaska crab fishing boat. You wouldn't bother with sails at all. So it wouldn't right. matter if you were low in the water while you're just chugging from Iceland to Ireland. Then you're tying up and just selling the drums. Nice. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's great. I love it. And so, uh, so anyway, we get to we get to uh, Dan, the the man who's got, you know, he's he's a, an American with a country sort of, uh, and we look at people who basically try to take things into their own hands because they're resourceful and they look at things falling apart around them. Which, by the way, reminds me of Kenosha, Wisconsin. I don't know. I, don't, I just for some yeah. reason I went inland there, Matt, and I thought about. Yeah. Um, no, it, it is on the it is on it's on the shore of Lake Michigan, and you know if you're um in, to Kenosha, Kenosha can, would consider itself a sea a seaside town, just like Chicago and Milwaukee. Um, you can't see across a Great Lake. It you know there are full size ships on those lakes. Oh, they're huge, so, and that's why yeah, you know, the huge. U.S. Navy, the U.S. Navy has this Great Lakes naval facility that's of right. all places inland, and but on Lake yeah. Michigan, which is a ocean going vessel body of water you know very cold very the, cold but that's where they do uh, uh, re, uh re, base recruit basic training and it's mighty, yeah, sure. cold, uh, mighty cold in january i understand and miserable yeah, yeah they, got, they got they, they got rid of their training their their boot camp facilities in orlando florida and san diego california and kept the one in michigan so you know that there were there were congressmen involved in that decision in case so you know here we have Kenosha falling apart. Now it seems like it's returned to some normalcy. So what do you think? Well, you tell us about your take on Kyle Rittenhouse, 17-year-old kid. Amazing. Yeah, I think he had some pretty strong mentoring. We still don't know the backstory um, of how he got the training. Uh, some stories are that he's got a, you know, got law enforcement in his family, but he obviously had some, some training and practice because um, – you know, he, he was very effective with that uh, AR-15, especially after he was being chased down the street. You know, the whole, the, the heart's going, right? The, you know, right. The, cardio is, the cardio is blasting, and he trips, and people are surrounding him. And he uh, shot two people there, one through the heart, which was a very rapid stop. Yeah, right through the heart, and the other guy in the arm, 
and initially back at the gas station, he had shot the first guy, that short bald guy that was the, the jailbird, the convict. Yeah, who right. The, the he was one in like charging 10 years. Him. Yeah, the one who was charging him initially, run, running, rushing him, bum rushing him. He shot him at, you know, two or three times, but also uh, killed that guy. But out of, so I, I, I'm, I would say a minimum of six shots to a maximum of maybe seven, maybe eight, if I can't count correctly. And the only people that he shot were people that were directly threatening him. You know, not... Sure. He didn't. He didn't shoot like somebody over behind somebody else. But of course, that's that's one um, interesting factor about shooting from the ground. The the muzzle was up, so you're either going to hit what you're shooting at, or you're going to just you know aim for the sky. And unlike what people have been taught, when bullets come down, they don't come down as fast as they go up. You know, they reach a uh, terminal velocity, and. Right. You know, essentially, it's like tossing a pebble off of a building. Um, right. You know, it could still hurt you. It could even wound you, but it's not like it's coming out, coming down from the, the same sky. velocity. Yeah, three thousand feet per second, not quite. But no. um, So, but I'm and just randomly. I mean, if you have to fire uh, into the sky, it's you know the odds are a million to one is going to hit anybody two oh, miles yeah. away. Yeah, he wants to be a, a cop or a fireman. He couldn't be yeah, a Marine, actually, which is interesting. He was, he was actually a uh, lifeguard in Kenosha. You know, because yes. of the, it, and it's funny because one of the issues is that he crossed quote, the state line from the state of Illinois to Kenosha. But the, the, uh, the state line between Illinois and Wisconsin is just below Kenosha. So it'd be very typical you know, for somebody to, to live just below the state line the nearest town would be Kenosha, whereas Chicago would be, you know, much further away. The oh, big sure. city of Chicago. So it's, it's very typical that uh, somebody, you know, will work across a state line because the nearest town of 100,000 is 20 miles north of Kenosha. And I understand sure. he was actually a lifeguard there. He was actually there that day. There's pictures of him scrubbing graffiti off of walls, you know, the... Uh, the profanity and the BLM and the uh, anarchy symbols, et cetera. So he, wow, yeah, he's definitely a, definitely a good guy. And he went there uh, only with a rifle. And it looks like one magazine. And the rifle apparently was something provided to him there. I mean, this is America. I mean, <laughs> yeah, there are sure, it's sure. Most, the most popular rifle in the country for the last 10 years is an AR-15. And yeah. Matt, how many, how many um, bullets are, or in a cartridge, an AR-15 cartridge, like or that. A, ma a magazine will, uh, the standard magazine today holds 30. Um, there are 20 round magazines available and in certain states where they're restricted, you might even be able to find a 10 round magazine. But the standard 90% of magazines for the AR-15 are a 30 round mag. And that's what he had in the rifle, but based on its length, its size. But um, sure. I don't know if he had 10 shots in it or 30, he only fired six or seven. Right. That's and you know, fired. Keep, and, right. and now, only had people he meant to shoot. Well, sure, of course. And he um he shot pretty well. That that one guy who, who lost his bicep, I mean, that wound was hellacious. Apparently um, he's kept his arm he's keeping his arm, and I'm sure it wouldn't be the same. Oh gosh, man. I mean skin grafts and Muscle grass yeah, but, but he's not going to have this. I'm sure that there's a lot of nerve and ligaments and things that were, are not going to ever recover. But he's not going to be an amputee either. He may wind up like, uh, if you remember Senator Bob Dole, he had like oh, a, sure. a, a gimpy arm that he would just hold a pen in. And he right, would shake hands with his left hand. So sure. he would just hold a pen in his bed. That he, his arm got machine gunned in Italy in World War II. And ever since yeah. then, he he had a... A useless arm. Well, heaven forbid. But I, that guy. but I don't feel sorry for that guy that got shot in the arm. He, no, Kyle, Kyle would have been in his. The guy was holding a pistol, and exactly that's he, my he point. Told, he told other people since his, his uh, hospitalization, he, his only regret was not killing Kyle. You know, emptying the magazine into him. But, yeah, that's um, right. Yeah, but Kyle could have put the you know double tapped him in the heart, and it would have still been self defense. So the fact that the guy's even sure. breathing is, you know, a testimony He's to lucky. Kyle Rittenhouse's uh, self-restraint. 
I mean, in the in the moment, you know, running down the street, being surrounded by people, being hit with a skateboard, kicked in the head, guy with a pistol, you know, he might have just shot the closest ten people, and it would not have been difficult. But he did. No, no, yeah, no, he didn't. He did. He had. He was very cool under pressure. Seventeen years old. The one thing I wanted to bring up is the fact that he's. They didn't allow him to go into the Marine Corps, and I think that the reason behind that is that he's a, he's a high school dropout apparently. I didn't know that. Yeah, I was checking because you know something. I mean, I thought. I mean, how can a kid like this be rejected by the Marine Corps? Because um, you know, after my son went went into the Corps, I saw you know lots. I mean, they basically if you get a hundred guys that you know go to Paris Island or or San Diego, they try to keep save them all. They maybe maybe they'll lose six or seven. Most of them graduate because it's just too. It's so hard to get kids for the for the armed forces. Yeah, it's interesting because um, even if you even if you arrive a little bit out of shape, they'll put you in like a pre-boot camp, like a conditioning course. An interesting thing that, that uh, about the Marine Corps compared to other branches of the military, there is something about it that appeals to uh, the Latino psyche, I, should I yeah. say? Yeah, sure. Um, and in, in the Army, the, the uh, ethnic breakdown is, is uh, fairly reflective of general society but in the right. marine corps there are the uh blacks african americans are underrepresented and hispanics are overrepresented yeah you know, there's, sure. there's something about applying for an elite military unit that uh maybe that's it's the like latin machismo or the uniform being cooler <laughs> Which anybody, yeah, will, really. which anybody will admit. You know? <laughs> well, let me tell you something. Man, you know, some of the Army uniforms look pretty cool. I have to say that. And, um, you know, they have a lot of really sharp units in the Army. Sure. You know, the, to, the Green Berets. But to join just a, a, a branch, for some reason, uh, uh, you know, uh, Hispanics are very well represented. Yeah, you know, absolutely. That's true. Something about That's true. being being sharp, being you know, being uh, in great shape, and being elite. Right. You know, you know one thing in, about in, yeah, yeah. In my in my novel, my second novel, the the uh, set in the Southwest, you know, there's a, a sort of a Marxist militia that's raised in uh, New Mexico, and for all of their villainy, you know, everybody will give them credit that they're in shape and they can shoot. <laughs> Right, no, absolutely. Man. A, <laughs> villain or not, point. villain or not, they're still, you know, they can still run and shoot. Well, you know, one thing that's interesting about the, the new Marine Corps, or let's say, let's say the new armed forces, so politically correct, yes. with women in infantry positions. Well, you know, Nick, Nick got injured in the, um, in the crucible. He got his, he was sparring with somebody. He, he gets a, a dislocated shoulder. So they take him in. They pop it back in. They bring him back out. He says, I'll tell you what, you don't have to, the, one of the sergeants, I guess, you don't have to carry your ruck, which is like 45 pounds less. So, but he still had to finish it. He had to march it. So anyway, long story short, he got an, uh, an injury. Then he had to have surgery. They send him back after graduation. They send him back to uh, Paris Island. So he's recuperating. Okay, so what's the point of this story? And by the way, people who, who listen to these interviews hate it when I talk. So I'll try to keep it quick. But he found out tons of women are injured. He was in a special, a special uh, group of people on uh, Paris Island. Like it's a special training company. And so you have, you have Marines that basically got injured during the crucible. Uh, and so they, got, they had to get surgery, the recuperation. They're, they're Marines, but they're physically convalescing. So he was there about seven months. The number of females... That are, who are convalescing is really high. Like out of a hundred people there, maybe in that in that unit, maybe sixty are females, and women only make up about maybe I don't know twenty five percent of the Marines or 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 twenty percent. I'm not sure. Yeah, yeah. but the, yeah, it's, it's like, biology. I mean, look, it's just biology, and it's and it's that it's a it's a metric or a marker of America's you know disconnect from reality. From basic, you know, realism that you we're living in a pretend world, and, and history teaches that when when civilizations go into this 
<clears throat> disconnect from reality. It's often, uh, you know, very bad things follow. You know, very bad things. Uh, French revolutions, concentration camps. There's just when there's a just basic disconnect from from, you know, uh, facing biological reality, and and yeah. certainly women are not made with the upper body strength, you know, to to put, uh, you know, twenty pounds of body armor on, followed by sixty pounds of, of you know, rucksack and ammunition and weapons. Right. It, it crushes them. It's Absolutely. crushing. And so but, then. Uh, but yeah, it's yeah, just, yeah. it's diversity uber alles. It's, it's, you know, regardless of anything. And we're going to pay for it because our enemies aren't going to be, aren't going to fight by PC rules. You know, oh, absolutely. They'll, yeah, they'll, they'll, they'll use that against us. That's our sure. weak point. That's absolutely. our weak spot. Absolutely. So, they'll, ca they'll capture and, and brutalize and torture the women just to demoralize the rest. Right. And so you know. imagine, based on what you know, a female Navy SEALs, what do you think of that? Well, uh, there has recently been one that got into training that didn't get very far, but, you know, it, it, it's all a question of the function of how PC it is. There have been females that were pushed through the Ranger course uh, in the Army and given, like, you know, 10 tries at the obstacle course with special coaches out of sight of anybody, so you don't even know if it was really, you know, if they really did it. Um, right. You know, whereas if a man failed it, you're just done. So they, they right, sure. will, will give a woman extra coaching and boosting and helping to get them through the hard parts. But that's not what happens in combat. I mean, that's not what happens in a war. Oh, sure. So, yeah, they're not going to say, hey, listen, you Chinese guys, can just give us a chance. She's, she's trying to get her body She's doing her best. That's off? right. That's right. She's doing her best. Well, at least send a really small guy after her. Where the, okay, guys, where, where are the female uh, soldiers in your unit, please? Yeah, it's, <laughs> yeah. And, and, it's so, and, and, you know, if, if we weren't so detached from reality, and it's funny because the NBA is just getting crushed in the ratings, Basket, National Basketball Association, getting crushed in ratings. Obviously, there's no fans in the stands. They have these, like, make-believe TV avatars in the stands behind the, the backboards. It's really oh, yeah. Very 1984 looking. But, there, but sure. there's not, yeah, but there's nobody watching on TV either. And, and, uh, their big audience now is China because in ch the Chinese never were watching, you know, in the arena anyway, right? The only way sure. that they ever thought was TV. So the only thing propping up the NBA, NBA now are the Chai Coms who, who make, you know, the NBA gear in sweatshops, you know, with, you know, Uyghur slaves and the NBA's wearing, you know, jerseys that say like, you know, Black Lives Matter on the back of the jersey that's made in China by slave labor. I mean, it's just perverse. Yeah, it's exactly. Completely perverse. And, and so, and you know, that, what do you think they? But that's a, that, but that's that's America. That's America in a nutshell. I mean, that's it's nuts. And and you know, the diversity in the military is getting to be like the Soviet Union in the in respect to um, you know, if you if you think back to the Soviet Union or even say Cuba in more modern era or North Korea. Everywhere you saw, like, you know, Marxist, Leninist, giant murals on buildings, you know, the, and that's what you see in the Navy on ships now inside are all these diversity is our strength. And, the, you know, the, the, the base website at the top of the page, diversity is our strength, right under that, to report, you know, racism, microaggression. That's like the top mission is to report. So it's like that the Soviet Union where the KGB ran everything. Now it's right, the right. diversity commissars run everything. So no. at, just like in the Soviet Union, you know, the, the general might have been nominally in charge of the division, but the blue cap, the KGB colonel, you know, really ran it. I mean, he didn't tell the general practically what to do, but he was there to keep an eye on the general and he could get the general fired or sent to the gulag. That's how it is right, in the sure. Navy now. The captain right. of the ship is, is terrified of the diversity commissar. And that's why, for example, two of our destroyers got you know, rammed by ships because the captain of the ship is so terrified of the diversity commissars that, you're, that they would have completely unqualified and incompetent people 
on the bridge and in the combat information center, which is like the virtual bridge inside the ship, you know, where all right, the radars, so, et cetera, are. So you have right. people who 20 years ago would have never been in charge of the bridge of a ship. Because they maybe were they'd be swabbing decks. Maybe. Or they wouldn't have been in the military at all. But they, they can't in any way delay the progress, the rank attainment, of people of, you know, certain genders and races. And if you said, wait a minute, you know, she is incompetent. She is a moron. She had to take every test 10 times and then we had to give her the the answers. Well, if you even would say that, you would be up for racism. So you just make sure she gets an A and now she's running the ship. And and it's ironic because these, these, uh, these are the ships, the class of ships with the uh, best anti-missile missiles that are responsible for you know, defending themselves or South Korea or an aircraft carrier from salvos of incoming Chinese, you know, supersonic, hypersonic missiles. And they were so incompetently run because of the diversity quotas that they couldn't even avoid running into other, into slow ships. How are they going to dodge, you know, salvos of high-speed missiles coming in at, at wave top level? They can't even get out of the way of tankers. So it, it, it goes to show you that the captain of the ship is much more terrified of the diversity commissar than of what happens in a war. See, he might get through his tour of duty on the ship without going to war with China. Yeah. But if he said, I'm sorry, there's no way I can approve you to be the officer of the deck. Then he would be up for being a racist. He would be right. done. Sure. His career would be over immediately. So you have right. somebody who can't add two plus two on running the bridge of a U.S. Navy warship. And well, our man, enemies are aware of this. Our, it's not like it's a secret. Right. It's not like this. It's, is a, a it's an open secret you don't talk about. You just right. work around, I guess, or try and, to. And how do you work around? You just try to get from port to port without running into things. And, or the, 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 uh, the big uh, Marine Corps, uh, what do they call it? The helicopter carrier, forget the class, terrible class. Anyway, the helicopter yeah. carrier uh, that burned, practically, it's virtually destroyed in San Diego. They're saying it may have been sabotaged by like a disgruntled crew member. I mean, can you, really? can you ever recall things like that happening in the U.S. Navy in oh, yeah, you know, prior no. eras? So you well, can't, I can't even remember the Normandy burn, yeah, so being you, burned so, by Nazis, but 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 I mean, you didn't think that an, an American sailor who was like having a love triangle or something would, you know, get their anger out by burning their ship. Wow. You see? So you have all these psychological, yeah. you have all these psychodramas on the ships and in the ranks of the military generally, because, you know, you, nobody can say anything. If there's a, you know, heterosexual or gay love triangle, it's just poisonous to morale because you have like jilted lovers feeling like, oh, now, now she's sleeping with the sergeant or now she's sleeping with the lieutenant. So you can right. just imagine what that does for morale and discipline. It's oh, poison. Sure. It's poison. Right. And our so enemies Matt, me, are well aware of it. Well aware. So Matt, let me let me bring it back to Bud's training, being a Navy SEAL. Let's suppose, I mean, this is a little hard to think of because I don't think you your uh, units were infected with PC thinking like today. No, but no. What would happen? Imagine, imagine, you know, you, you bring yourself you know, up to the uh, 21st century and you're a, a Navy SEAL and you've got to deal with diversity issues, microaggressions, um, affirmative action. What does that do mentally? It's, it, to, wasn't uh, in our, it really wasn't in our mental vocabulary. I mean, we had, we had not many, but there were black guys in the teams and you know, we didn't think, we thought about it in terms of qualifications and ability. That was it. Yeah, they, but, either know, they made it through or they didn't. Nobody right. was giving, like, the, the person of, uh, of color or the person who was transgender or whatever, some special 
let's say preference because of the fact they they brought in um, diversity to the to the unit, right? So that didn't happen. But what does happen if you've got something whereby you've got a SEAL team and you've got, like you said, a love triangle, somebody who gets jilted, and um, or or you know, if you've just got if you've got a you know a four man tent that was set up for the NCOs and a 20 man tent for the privates. But everybody knows that one of the female privates is in the four man tent sleeping with the, the, you know, the first sergeant. And then she's never pulling duty at night. She's never cleaning the latrine. Oh yeah. Sure. I mean, that's that's, great. And so this is, it's not like we had to do this to know what would happen. You know, people were, saying 20 years ago, if you do this, this will happen because it's not like we're inventing the wheel. Militaries have always known this. You know, there, there were ships where homosexuality was tolerated and it was poisonous to morale because people didn't want to get on them because you could be yeah. like molested in your bunk. And You're right, you know, raped in your bunk. The whole story with the British Navy, rum, sodomy, and the lash. You know, it's, it's, it's poisonous to morale, and it's not like people didn't know what would happen. Not to mention, now in combat arms. So, to me, the significance of it, of course, if we get into a war, will be clobbered. You know, in, in, in the Battle of the Bulge, people have seen the movie, etc., uh, this German unexpected winter German counterattack in late 19, you know, December of 1944, yeah. caught the American army by surprise, and the cooks and the clerks had to pick up a rifle and get in the firing line. And the a lot of them so- were saying, "But I'm just a cook. I'm just a clerk." And it's like tough shit, man. <laughs> For the next week, you're a rifleman. You know? but I'm a typist. Well, yeah. If if you have women integrated into the military to the extent that we do now in a modern war it's not going to be like world war one where you've got a front line and you know occasional attacks over the top it's going to be very mixed because people will be doing helicopter assaults you know all kind of of tricky you know ways of getting in the rear infiltration etc so it will be very common for like a headquarters that's 40% female to be overrun by like, you know, enemy commandos. Right. And, 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 and enemy, they psyched up. And the enemy commandos, if they, for example, if they're, you know, Muslims of cert, certain nationalities, then they'll be saying, I'm getting my 72 virgins right now because they don't expect to live the rest of the week. You know, they, they, sure they, go, in, they go on the mission with a suicide mentality that we're going to, you know, hop out of our delivery vehicles, whether it's trucks or some other infiltration means or however they're, you know, however they're delivered, they're going to attack the hospital or attack the, the headquarters building and barricade it. And de- they don't expect to be relieved or to escape. So while they're in this building that's 40% female, they're just going to, you know, from their point of view, make the best of it. And that's oh, really no, but they, bad, and that's bad for morale too. I mean, that's... Sure, you know, but you know, there's, something, there's something else. It's not just there's incoming to the headquarters, because you've also got um, incoming within the headquarters because you have a jihadist who, in quote, becomes radicalized, right? You know, so that, well, we that, had, that whole... We idea. actually had that in... Uh, we, we had that at, um, in Desert Storm and other situations, like where a, Absolutely. Black, a black sergeant started throwing grenades into the officer's tent. You know, sure. He'd gone and through all many- that training... He'd gone through all that training, and all he did was, once he got to the uh, Muslim world, he felt like I'm a sellout if I, um, you know, if I fight for the, you know, he was hearing the sermons that basically said, you may not fight for the infidels against the Ummah, you know, the world, the Muslim nation. The, oh, sure. You know, and he, it was torturing his conscience, so to speak, and he was hearing lectures like on, you know, on CD and, and radio and so forth. And when he took his chance, he like threw grenades into an officer's tent. And yeah, well, or sure. the guy Major Hassan, Major Hassan in Fort Hood, Texas. Perfect case. See, here's the thing: people say, "Well, yeah, but what about what about the cases in Iraq? I mean, in Afghanistan, they gave us good intel. They're Muslims. They're giving us good information. 
Well, that's true. But was that because of Islam or in spite of Islam? Right. And, and not only in, is it in spite of Islam, but there is a very high risk, and it's an unknown risk, of, of people uh, having like a reconversion process where they've been, you know, having no beard and having like infidel girlfriends, drinking alcohol, eating bacon, whatever, for years. Yeah. Then they can be, be re-recruited back into being, you know, a sincere believing Muslim. That's a big tip off if the guy who, you know, used to drink beer and, ne- and was clean shaven is suddenly wearing Middle Eastern garb and grows a beard. That's like a worrisome symbol if you're smart because that's what happened with Major Hassan. But um, these guys often will, in order to prove their bona fides as a true Muslim again, will do an act of terrorism. And, and you know, the, the one way to get instant, instant forgiveness of all of your exactly. un-Muslim behavior is to do a, a, a jihad on your way out the door. There's even the Air Egypt pilot who nosedived a plane into the ocean he wasn't even a scheduled pilot. He was uh, something was going wrong with his with his uh, uh, his finances or his family life. But he was basically being called back to Egypt from work, from New York, and he wasn't even a scheduled pilot on that Air Egypt flight. I think it was like going from New York to Europe. And he came into the cockpit and asked, like, "Hey, just want to hang out with the pilots?" So they said, "Fine." when one of the pilots went up to go to the bathroom, he jumped into the other seat and then pushed the yoke all the way down, you know, yelling Allah Akbar. Um, oh, there you and, go. And, and they know that because it would never happen before, you know, they didn't even know for sure what would happen if one guy is pulling all the way up on the yoke and the other guy is pushing all the way down on the yoke. You know, you're still going to crash yeah, the plane. Well, that you know, puts yourself in a situation who's stronger maybe. You know, but it, but you're going to crash the plane. The pilot pulling up couldn't overcome the guy pushing down. You know, because well, they, they, anyway, the plane crashed, and the final things are Allah Akbar. And this is a guy who was, you know, infidel girlfriends, drinking alcohol, gambling. Right. But he figured instead of going back and getting fired from my job and being disgraced and humiliated, I'll just, you know. Go out in glory. Go out in glory straight back to Allah. So even the interpreters that everybody loves and they're the great guys, even I, don't, I wonder about their children because the phenomenon we've learned from Europe is it's often the second generation. And the generation, the generation that came from North Africa to work in the factories in the 50s and 60s, they, are, they may be more or less fully westernized, but then their children grow up hearing the uh, Muslim sermons and they consider their fathers to be like Uncle Tom, like a sellout. And, yeah, and you know, the, normal, the, the normal son versus father type of, you know, teenage rebellion syndrome turns into, you're a terrible Muslim, and I'm going to sh- show you how to be a good Muslim. Right. So you what know? happens then, you know, Matt, that begs the question, you know, well, 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 what about, what about, and what about? Well, look, you look at, um, what's a Christian? A Christian who's fallen away from the faith goes to, to brothels, drinks, curses, swears, you know, fights, always brawling. You know, bad guy, right? And all of a sudden, he really steals. All of a sudden, he says, "I'm coming back to the Christian faith." <laughs> well, he's means, not gonna, he, he's the gonna be he's there gonna on duty. Blow up an airplane. Yeah, of course. No, he'll be there saying, offering to, to say, "I'll tell you what, you look kind of tired. I'll I'll do night. I'll do fire watch tonight." <laughs> right. No, he'll be a better person. <laughs> but the thing about Islam, and it's you know, there's a good argument to make for it being the uh, for Muhammad being the Antichrist. In that, oh, sure. what Muhammad did was invent a cult that would be self-perpetrating or self-perpetuating, rather. The, yeah. the author of Dianetics and the Scientology cult, named L. Ron Hubbard, yeah. he made a he made a bet with another author, another science fiction author. I can't, it's, who's one of the famous science fiction authors, Asimov or somebody. But it was uh, a okay. it was a bet that I can create a cult. You know, laughing about how easy people are to, to bamboozle and, and fraud and, and uh, scam. He said, I can make a cult that will outlive me. That was a bet. And he won the bet because there's still Scientology and L. Ron Hubbard's been gone for, you know, a couple decades, decades and decades. Right. right. So 
Muhammad did even better because Muhammad set up a cult where all of the incentives are perverted. So you are allowed, not only allowed, you are encouraged to capture infidel slaves and they become your property. And you can never have a, a, uh, an abolition movement because then you would be saying that Muhammad, who is the perfect man, did something bad. So no, you, you so, can, Matt. Wait, but you can. Mu- but Muslims, as long as, if they're Muslim slaves, Matt, yeah, then but you can Muslims, liberate the Muslim slaves. But, but Muslims can never say that like having sex slaves is bad because Muhammad did it. So sure. when, when, the, when the Europeans, the French and the English, when they got to Africa and the Middle East, they banned slavery in spite of the local culture. They banned it while they had the power. You know, the French in, in Morocco, for example, they were, they were abolishing slave markets in like the 1940s in Morocco. Yeah. They were going in with police and arresting people and punishing people, but they never from within themselves said, you know what, slavery is wrong. We've got to get rid of it. And now there are slave markets back in, in Libya. So one oh, of right. the un, unintended consequences of um, getting rid of Gaddafi is breaking Libya into like little warlord fiefdoms. And one of the ways that you make money in historically, you know, slaves are essentially a currency that can, is self-mobile. You know, you can, if you have sure. a truck, you can put them in a truck, but you can make your money walk from point A to point B and do work for you. So, right. you know, slavery is back in open slave markets in Libya because there's no central authority that's, you know, even Sudan is trying to come back to the modern world because they've been ostracized for a long time. They've been on the, Nine, you know, the, the bad yeah. country list. So, yeah, well, so, they've, they've had, yeah, by the way, speaking of just South Sudan, which is Christian or, or non-Muslim, right. uh, you know, like 220,000 slaves in other parts of Africa captured and I know one story, William Bull Guy Deng, he was um, seven years old, Mujahideen went to his house, went to his village, killed a bunch of people, took them off. They marched them 200 miles. Here he is, a seven-year-old boy, marched 200 miles and sold into slavery, chained up at night. Yeah, and, and you know, this is such a slander against Europeans you know, in uh, white Americans, Europeans, whatever you want to call us, that we somehow are like uniquely guilty of, of being slavers, slave masters. When it was, it was the British uh, abolitionists who passed the laws that, that, you know, set up Britain to outlaw slavery. And same thing in America. It, you know, every country had slavery. It was the Brits and the Americans that outlawed it. But it was never outlawed in any Muslim country, only forced, into, forced underground by Europeans when they controlled those countries during that period. But, yeah, they, and, and even, you know, the movies that you see that are glorifying the Native Americans, there's a lot of admiral qualities when you look at, you know, Comanches and Sioux and, and Apaches, etc. But they were brutal. They were brutal. Oh, sure. They, Nobody they, massacred, that. they massacred, they tortured, and they enslaved. They all right. captured children, and then, no matter how brutally you treat a child, you know, torture, tied up for weeks, treated like a dog, beaten like a dog. Yeah, sure. Stockholm hey, syndrome. The- Stockholm syndrome will kick in after a few yeah. months of being a brutal treatment. When you start treating a slave nicely, two years later, the slave is completely brainwashed into being a full member of your tribe and hating the enemies of the tribe. And so then, this isn't is, that amazing? This is done over and over again. But my point is you know, that Stockholm Syndrome is not the, that's an interesting aspect of it. All of the Native American tribes captured and used slaves. They all did. I mean, and, sure. and, the, and in, going back into antiquity, slavery was a kind of an economic answer to what do you do after a war? Is it, you could say, well, if you conquer another country, do we just like let the people go? Where are they going to go? We're now invading their country. Um, should we just butcher them all? So the choices really came down to, well, we've just beat your army and there's 500 men left alive. 
would you prefer to be put to the sword or put in chains? You know, oh, they, sure. uh, there was not an option of like parole to utopia. That was not never. Uh, no, an no, no, forget that. Yeah, it's put put sure. to the and sword it, or work. Uh, the the North Africans when they captured uh, Europeans. If you just had looked hard working with big shoulders, you could be chained into a galley. Is that it, 